Well, good evening everyone. Uh, just like to welcome you along to our series about uh, one another. And tonight we're going to be looking at praying for one another. And our passage of scripture is James chapter 5, the book of James chapter 5. If you want to open your Bibles and uh, look that up, James just comes directly after the book of Hebrews. We're going to begin our reading by singing James, or by, sorry, reading James chapter 5, beginning to read at verse 13. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you ill? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up if they have sinned. They will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And that ends our reading. And we know that the God will bless that to us. That he does bless us whenever we read his word. We're going to have a look really at uh, verse 16. We're going to concentrate on verse 16. Where it says that James tells us that we are to pray for one another. Just reading this letter. It's very clear that. James wrote the letter to the churches that belonged to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he done that because he shows a great love and concern for the churches. In chapter 5, James encourages the church to pray for anyone in trouble or anyone who is sick. In verses 14 and 15, it says, Any one of you which is sick, he should call the elders of the church to pray over him or her and anoint them with oil in the same, sorry, anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well and the Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. So, James is telling us here that there's a responsibility on the elders to pray for the church. But James doesn't stop there. He doesn't just leave it there that it's uh, only the elders' responsibility to pray for the church. He goes on in verse 16 to tell the church that we should confess our sins to each other and pray for each other so that we may be healed. I believe that, that James uh, is not talking about confessing our wrongdoing or our sin uh, as some people would confess to a priest. The place for that sort of confession is for us to confess to our great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ and him alone. What James is talking about is to confess our sin against a brother or sister in the church who we have sinned against. And probably that would go for uh, people outside the church as well if we have sinned against them. Now it's not that we confess to the whole church, but to confess to those that we have sinned against. If the sin has been committed against a group of people in the church, then the confession must be made to the group as well. But first, before any of that, there must be a spirit of penitence. Knowing that we have wronged someone, it probably will be very hard to go to that person, the person that we have sinned against, 
to ask for forgiveness and to put things right. It may be really hard to do this, but it must be done. Jesus tells us in, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 23. Therefore, he says, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift at the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother. Then come and I'll offer your gift at the altar. So reconciliation has priority really over your act of worship. But then again, if someone has wronged you in some way and remembers that wrong, and then they come to you and confess to you and seeks forgiveness, then as hard as that may be, we are to forgive that person and pray for them and even pray with them. And we're to forget about that sin. We're not to hold it against them. Uh, we're not to cast it up maybe a few weeks or maybe even years down the road. But you know, sometimes our pride can get in the way of us forgiving someone. Someone who might have hurt us really badly. And maybe you feel that the hurt was so great that we can't forgive. But you see, in both cases, we may have to humble ourselves. And that's not very easy, to humble ourselves. We all like to think of ourselves more highly, really, than, than we should. But the Lord Jesus, when teaching his disciples to pray, said that, that we should pray for forgiveness for our sins. We're to pray to our Heavenly Father for forgiveness for our sins. But then straight away it says, as we have forgiven those who sin against us. He also said that we should forgive sin, not seven times as I think it was Peter suggested, but 77 times we're always to forgive. So with this in mind, how really should we be praying for one another? Why should we be praying for one another? Well, first of all, the church is the body of Christ Jesus. When we look at our physical body, if something is wrong and we hurt ourselves with broken bones, cuts or injuries, then we do something about it. And so we should also do something about it if there's something wrong in the body of Christ, the church. If someone, one part of the body is suffering, then we should share that burden and pray for that person. We're to take their burdens on ourselves. As Jesus took on our burden of sin on himself. We don't do this just because it's commanded. But we do it out of love for the body of Christ, the church. Samuel, the prophet, and the last judge of Israel said this. 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 23, in his farewell speech to the people. As for me, Samuel says, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you. And I will teach you the way that is good and right. The way you see that is good and right is that we should pray for one another. And when we pray for each other, it's an act of faith. It's an act of faith because we believe in the one that we're praying to. We, we don't believe that uh, we're just praying in the thin air. We believe that we're talking to someone. But who is this one? Well, he's the God who created all things, who created us. He's a God who knows everything. He's a God who is ever present with his people. 
and he desires to communicate with his people. He is the high and mighty one, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and he shows a bounding love for his people. In Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 7 it tells us there, What other nation is so great as to have their gods near them, the way the Lord our God is near us? And this is a bit, whenever we pray to him. Whenever we pray to him. You see our God encourages us, encourages his people to pray. God said to to Job's friends, he said, my servant Job will pray for you and I will accept his prayer. We don't just pray for physical healing, but we also pray for spiritual healing for God's people. In Luke chapter 18 verse 1, Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that We should always pray and not give up. You see, prayer is communion. Communication with our Heavenly Father. But you know, it's not a one-way street. Yes, we talk to God. But very often, we treat prayer as if it's us that does all the talking and our Heavenly Father just listens. Friends, our Father speaks to us through his word. When we pray, we don't just talk. We listen to what God is saying to us from his word. And it may be difficult at times. We may not fully understand. So I want to read to you a wee bit uh, from God's revelation to the prophet Elijah. In 1 Kings 19, when the Lord was about to pass by and Elijah was in a cave, there was a great and powerful wind that tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. Then there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. Then came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. After the fire came a gentle whisper, or as the King James Version says, a still small voice. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? You see, when we pray, we have to listen as well. Listen for God speaking to us. And we must remember, you know, that that God knows all things. He knows all things about us. Things in the past, things in the future that we don't have any idea about. And he is... A great God who listens to his people but also speaks to his people. In Acts chapter 2 verse 42, speaking about the fellowship of believers in the early church, we're told that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. They devoted themselves to all of these things. They devoted themselves to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. All the believers were together. There wasn't just one or two of them who decided will have a prayer meeting. There wasn't five or six who said, well, if you have a prayer meeting, we'll come along. No. It said all the believers were together and had everything in common. 
They sold their possessions and goods. And they gave to anyone who had need. And every day, not just on their Sabbath, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all of the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Friends, do we love the church? Do we love the church enough to pray for each other? I'm not talking about the building. I'm talking about all of the people. Do we love God enough to do what his will is for us? Can we humble ourselves to admit we have sinned against someone? And can we humble ourselves to forgive? Just to sum up, and finally, we pray for one another because it is God's will for us. We pray for one another because it creates and maintains unity in the church. We pray for one another out of love for our brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. We pray for one another because it brings glory to God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, that's what the Christian life is about. Bringing glory to God. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ did when he was here on earth. He brought glory to his Father. And in turn, after he had humbled himself and gave glory to his Father, his Father glorified him. His, glor- his Father glorified him after his death and resurrection and ascension into heaven. And you know, the wonderful thing about it is that if we glorify our Father in heaven and the Lord Jesus Christ, then someday, When the Lord calls us home, then he will glorify us. And he will take us to be with him in heaven. And that is tremendous. Something we can't fathom. We we can't really um we can't really understand that heaven is such a beautiful place. And it's such a beautiful place because the most beautiful person that has ever lived will be there, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he has promised to come back. He has promised to take us to be with himself. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. What Amazing words from the Lord Jesus Christ. It's important, very important, that we pray for one another. We want one another to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. There have been times, many times, when people have come into our congregation and they have made a profession of faith. Then... They stayed for a while and gradually faded out. And before too long, they had turned their back on the Lord Jesus. They had gone back onto their old path again. And I don't know about you, but there are times that that has happened and I didn't pray for those people. I didn't pray for the church. But we should, we should pray for each and every one. Not only when they're in difficulties or are struggling with life, but we should pray and rejoice with them as well. 
for when good things happen in their lives. And you know, when we can rejoice with other people, it lifts our hearts as well. But we just don't want our hearts to be lifted all the time. We want to take the burdens of our brothers and sisters. And as Jesus said, we need to take up our cross and follow him. As he took up his cross, he took the burden of our sin on himself. And we need to take the burden of our brothers and sisters and pray for each other and love each other. Thank you so much for listening. I just want to pray. Our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your word and how it speaks into our hearts. Oh, help us, Lord, by your Spirit to love each other, to be able to humble ourselves and to forgive one another, to be able to humble ourselves and admit our guilt, to humble ourselves to in love for our brothers and sisters in Christ. So Lord we ask all these things and we ask it because we want to glorify your holy name. We want to lift the church up to you so that the world can see your glory. Just as the Lord Jesus Christ showed your glory to the world. Help us to be more like the Lord Jesus day after day. Help us to grow in faith and be mature Christians. And Lord, just be with us in Abbott's Cross. We pray for our brothers and sisters all over the world who, um, who are being persecuted at this time, who are struggling with faith, who are struggling with all sorts of issues, struggling with persecution, poverty, everything you, you, you can think of. We pray for each and every one of them because they are your church. They are your body, part of your body, just as we are. So, Lord, we ask that you would be with each and every one of them. For we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening. God bless.